In the last section, we looked at functions that I said weren't really multivariable functions. The, the codomain had many variables. You know, the codomain was R2, R3, R whatever. Um, but the domain was just a subset of R. So the, the function itself, the, the variables you stuck in the function were just real numbers. And you know, that's not really kind of the multivariable calculus. Multivariable Functions usually refer to functions whose domain is a subset of Rn, where n is greater than or equal to 2, so that you give the function two or more real variables. Um, in this section, we're going to look at some introductory material on such functions, functions whose domain are subsets of R2 or higher dimensional Euclidean space, but not look at any calculus. The calculus will be in the next chapter. In this chapter, we just want to give some general definitions. We also need to talk uh, in this section. We need to um, give some general definitions and define continuity and state a theorem about continuity. Um, that are a couple of theorems that will be important to us later. So first, you know, just a couple of examples of multivariable functions. Uh, if I want to use the examples in the book, there. So. Here's one example of a multivariable function, the function f of xy from r2 to r that takes xy to x squared minus y squared. It's a multivariable function. You give it two real numbers. It gives you back one real number. It's not terribly exciting um, or not terribly complicated. But your codomain doesn't have to just be r. You don't have to get back a real number. You could have many variables in the domain and codomain. So for instance, m of rst, you don't have to call the variables x, y, and z. Those are our favorites, but we'll try. Is s times sine of t plus r squared comma rst comma t ln of s squared plus 1. These are just examples of multivariable functions. You give this one two real numbers, it gives you back a single real number. You give this one three real numbers, it gives you back three real numbers. As in the last section, these, these three functions that you get in the codomain are these are the component functions. And typically, if oops, I meant to underline it. Typically, if you've called this one m bar, a stand, standard names for the component functions, you can give them other names, but standard names would be m1, m2, and m3 without the, the underline. So, for these component functions, we're looking at m1 is the function from r3 to r that's given by m1 of rst is, well, this is s sine of t plus r squared. And m2 also goes from r3 to r. And each one of these, each of the component functions, just gives you back a single real number. But m2 of rst is rst and m3 of rst is t times the natural log of s squared plus 1. So um, yeah, it's just, this shouldn't seem too difficult. It's just you're allowed to give more, more real numbers to your function now than just one real number. Um, something that we're going to look at in the next section is graphs. of multivariable functions. Now, <clears throat> as you probably know, looking at graphs gives you a nice geometric picture that helps you describe functions, analyze functions. How, <laughs> you know, what, what graphs are we going to be able to look at to help us with multivariable functions? Well, not too many. So suppose you have a multivariable function f that goes from, we'll say it goes from some set e to some set f, 
where E is a subset, so of Rn, that means it's some of the points in Rn, doesn't have to be all of Rn, and F is a subset of Rp, so it's, the function goes into Rp, but it may go into some smaller subset of Rp, so this just means you give this in real numbers, but maybe not any in tuple of real numbers, and it gives you back uh, a p tuple of real numbers. Uh, it gives you back p real numbers in order, but maybe not all of them. Um, well, in cases like this, we would typically write we like to write x for all of the variables in the in the domain and y for all of the variables in the codomain. So this means really we're looking at y1 through yp equals, well, f of x1 through xn. And the f, f, you can break that down into its component function. So this is the same as taking f1 of, it really gets long if you write out all of this, but you're looking at the component functions and giving each component function the output of each component function a variable name. So for instance, y1 is f1 of x1 to xn. Okay, what does this have to do with graphs? Well, <laughs> if you think about a graph of, of a function from single variable calculus, you look at you have something like y equals f of x, x is a real number, y is a real number. The graph is the set of points x comma y in R2 such that y equals f of x. Notice that yeah, that's a single real number. That's a single real number. But the graph, you get a real number, comma, a real number. So it sits in R2. Where would the graph of a function from a subset of Rn to a subset of Rp lie? Well, that's um, the graph. So the graph would be, there is. the set of points, and now it would be x, y, so all of your x variables followed by all of your y variables. Where does that lie? Well, your x variables, this is in real numbers, this is p real numbers, you're inside r n plus p, such that y equals f of x. So if we're going to try to draw the graph so that, so that it can help us describe the function f, we can't use very big numbers here, right? Uh, most that we can draw is r3, and even then we draw it in kind of a flat surface. So we draw an r2, but in perspective to hope to capture r3. So we want n plus p to be less than or equal to 3. Um, if we want a multivariable function, then we want n to be at least 2. That means that p can be at most 1 if we want to have a hope of drawing a graph of multivariable functions. That means that we want to graph functions that just look like, well, two variables here, one variable here. So normally we would use x, y, and z. Um, we want to graph functions of two variables that are real valued. So that's, that don't take a, a vector of values or a multi-component value, they just have a single real number. So a real valued function of two variables. Um, we will look at these extensively in the next section, but this is just kind of a, an explanation of why those are the ones we'll concentrate on because we have like no hope. You can define the graph. But if your point looking at the graph is to visually, is to see, to get some geometric feel for what's going on, this is the only multivariable case we can do. All right. Um, 
there are uh, we'd like to I'd like to define a level set of a multivariable function. So just an idea of what a level set is. Suppose you look at Consider a set of points in R3. Consider the set of points x, y, z in R3 such that x plus y plus z equals 7 and 2x minus y plus 3z equals 4. You could describe this in the following way. So you could define the, multi, the multivariable function f of x, y, z to be x, um, to be x plus y plus z comma, 2x minus y plus 3z, you could, you could make this definition, so this is a function from R3 into R2, and then the set of points where x plus y plus z equals 7 and 2x minus y plus 3z equals 4 is exactly the set of points this is where fr equals 7, 4, right? Because to say that f, this underline f, f bar, f, f underline is, is 7, 4 means the first number is four, uh, 7 and the second number is 4, but that's exactly what this says. Well, this is a level set, level set. Where f equals 7, 4. All a level set means is you pick a fixed value for, for the function. So you have f going from some subset of Rn to some subset of Rp. You have b in f. And you look at the level set. Where f equals b is just it's the set of those x's in E such that f of x equals b. <clears throat> we'll look at level sets often throughout the textbook, so that's um, just want to introduce that terminology. Um, there are some special kinds of multivariable functions that we want to look at, real valued multivariable functions uh, generally. They, um, they're simple, but they're still interesting. So we need a definition. Definition. A function L from Rn to R is linear. If and only if it just looks like constants times the variables added together. 
So it's linear if and only if L of X, if and only if, let me say, there exists a vector A in Rn such that L of X, so if this is A equals A1 through An, in Rn, such that A1, X1, so L of X is A1, X1 plus A2, X2 plus, plus An, Xn. So an example is just something like, well, something like we had that a minute ago, like L of X, Y, Z instead of X1, X2, X3, X, Y, Z equals um, 2x minus y plus 3z. Um, that's a linear function. It's just constants times the variables added together. We, we need to be a little careful. There's a very similar kind of thing. A function, I'll call it a, from r and r is affine linear. Some books refer to this as linear, but there's a real problem with that since linear has a very technical meaning in linear algebra, is affine linear. If and only if there exists A in Rn and a real number B, such that L of A of X, A for affine, equals this but plus B. So for an affine linear function, what's the difference between a linear function and an affine linear function? An affine linear function is allowed to have a constant that's not multiplied times a variable. So it could be 3X or 2X minus Y plus 3Z plus 7. This is affine linear, but not linear. Now, of course, every linear function is affine linear because you can pick b to be 0. So if you're linear, you're affine linear. Affine linear is more general, though. You can, you can have plus a non-zero constant. Um, for a multivariable function, so um, a multivariable function, f, uh, sorry, a multi-component function, f from Rn to Rp is linear, or respectively affine linear. If and only if each component is is whichever is linear or respectively affine linear. Now I just defined level sets a minute ago and I just defined linear and affine linear functions um, and we have actually looked at level sets of linear and affine linear functions in the section on planes and lines um, we looked at, you can look at so just as a quick example. Um, if you look at L, of x, y, z equals 3x minus 2y 
plus 7z, and a of x, y, z, is 3x minus 2y plus 7z plus 5. Then, <clears throat> if you look at, consider the level sets, so this one, this function is linear, this one's affine linear. Consider the level sets. where L equals 0 and A equals 0. Well, these are just, <clears throat> what are these? L equals 0, that's the set of points where 3x, and that's just a way of saying, look at those points where this equation is satisfied. 3x minus 2y plus 7z equals 0. And this one is 3x minus 2y plus 7z equals 5. Uh, plus 5 equals 0. Well, we looked at this. This is a plane. And it certainly contains the origin because when x is 0, y is 0, and z is 0, the equation is satisfied. This is a plane through the origin. This plane is parallel to this plane because we know how you figure out a normal vector, you just read off the coefficients in front of x, y, and z. This plane has, and that plane have a common non-zero normal vector, 3 minus 2, 7. So this plane is parallel to the plane described by this, but this plane doesn't pass through the origin because 0, 0, 0 doesn't satisfy this equation. This is a parallel plane, parallel to that one. Parallel plane, not through the origin. All right, um, so you know we have looked, you know we didn't call it this, but we have looked at level sets of linear and affine linear functions in three variables already. All right, what I need to define now is continuity. We need to, I need to say some things about continuity. In, in later sections, we're gonna talk about derivative properties and differentiability of multivariable functions. But in this section, I, I need to get continuity out of the way. I don't want this to be too technical. Um, I will state the rigorous definition of continuity, but then I'll appeal to theorems that will tell us, as we do in single variable calculus, to say these functions that we give names to and all these combinations of them are continuous. So, all right. So, what do we want continuity to mean? Well, so I'm going to assume I have a function, a multi-component, multi-variable function, where the domain is some subset of Rn, so I'm giving it n real numbers, so a function of n variables. And I could make the codomain something weird, but it doesn't change anything if I make it all of RP. Um, if it were F, if this were some subset of RP, if you extend the codomain, you just say, oh, well, I'm looking at it inside of RP instead of this smaller subset of RP. It won't change anything that we're doing, so I'm just going to assume this is RP over here. What do we want continuity to mean? What do we want it to mean that F is continuous at a point A in E? Well, we want it to mean what we wanted it, what it meant for a function of a single variable. That if you take another point in the domain that's close to A, then the values of F. You know, if you take another point X that's close to A, then the value of F of X is close to the value of F of A. That's what continuity means in one variable, and that's what we 
That's what it means here. So it means, now, of course, we have to write this in a more rigorous way, but what do we want it to mean that f is continuous at a point A in E? We want if x in E, so something in the domain of f, so we can actually apply f to it, is close to A. So then f of x is close to f of a. All right, but you have to make this rigorous just like we did in one variable calculus, and that's with the epsilons and deltas, but it's, I'll write it, but it, it's more important that you understand the intuition for it than that you understand the technical definition. So the real definition, I'm still assuming I have F and A is defined over there. Definition, F is continuous at A. If and only if, here we go, with the epsilons and deltas, if and only if, for all epsilon greater than zero, this epsilon is how close you want f of x and f of a to end up being. For all epsilon greater than zero, there exists, there exists delta greater than zero, such that for all x in E, the domain of F, such that, for all x and E, such that, such that the distance between x and A is less than delta, such that, so distance, remember, is the length of the distance between two points. Remember, it's, it's the magnitude of the vector you get by subtracting them. If and only such that this is less than delta, such that for all uh, such that the absolute value of f of x minus f of a is less than epsilon. Okay. What this says is just that somebody tells you how close they want f of x to be to f of a. That's they specify an epsilon. You can tell them how close you have to make x to a as long as x is in e to make that happen. So this is the the technical definition of being continuous at a point, f is just flat out, we just say is continuous without reference to a point, it means it's continuous at each point in its domain. So that's the, def that's the intuition of continuity. There's the, the technical definition of continuity. Um, <laughs> if you had to prove some, a function was continuous using this definition, it would take a long time uh, for most functions. And so the question is, how are we going to look at a function in the, throughout this book how are we going to look at a function and know whether it's continuous or not? If you remember what we did in single variable calculus, we had a result that said all elementary functions are continuous. And what's an elementary function? An elementary function is, was a function from, the real, from a subset of the real numbers into the real numbers that could be written as some finite combination of adding, subtract, applying, multiplying, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, raising to powers, um, applying an exponential function, um, using trig functions, using inverse trig functions, using logarithms. And you do any of those things in any combination you want, a finite number of times, and all of the, that, those are elementary functions. And all elementary functions are continuous, which means 
continuous at every point in their domain. Yeah, there might be some points not in their domains, but aside from, that, but aside from those places, they're continuous everywhere. The good news is that's true for multivariable functions as well. So you have a function f. So here's a multivariable, multi-component function. So f of x can be written as, you can write it in terms of its component functions. So the theorems that we need are, first of all, this is continuous. If and only if each component function is continuous. Right, so right, when you have a multi-component function, it's continuous if and only if each component function is continuous. But each of the component functions just goes as a function into R. So if we knew what a continuous function, a real value continuous function was, we'd be all set. All right? But this is where you talk about elementary functions. So I think I picked a specific ugly function in the book. Um, so one specific ugly function <laughs> I picked in the book was, so a real valued function. So you give it, I give it three real numbers, but it gives me back a single one, is e to the x, y, sine of z, over 7 plus y ln of x plus z. Something like this. Now, <clears throat> when we specify a function like this, first of all, the domain is implicit. We mean, like it is frequently for functions of a single variable, it means that you make this definition for all triples x, y, and z for which this is defined. Well, you don't want to divide by zero, so you need this not for the denominator not to be zero, and you also need to, when you take natural logs, you can only do that for positive reals, so you need x plus z to be positive. So the domain is implicit, but the real point is that function is some combination of a finite number of times of adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, raising to powers, um, taking exponential functions, taking logarithms, using trig functions, using inverse trig functions. It's now got several variables in it, x, y, and z, but this is still what we call an elementary function. And it's a theorem. All elementary functions are continuous. understand what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that all functions are continuous. I'm not saying anything close to that. It's easy to define discontinuous functions just like it was in one variable. You can just do it piecewise. You say that the function ha is, has this value or a value defined by this formula if x, y, and z satisfy this condition and given by another formula if x, y, and z satisfy the opposite condition. Um, but what it does mean is the functions that we kind of have given names to and combinations of them, like this, that you can just instantly say these are continuous. Now, understand continuous means continuous at each point in the domain, and the implied domain of this is not, is not obvious. But as I said, you need the denominator not to be zero, and you need x plus z to be positive. And sometimes the implied domain would be even harder than that. But what you can say instantly is that that function is elementary. And when you combine that with this, that all elementary functions are continuous, of, and now this is for multivariable functions, and that a function, multi-component function is continuous if and only if each component function is continuous, this is how we will conclude throughout the rest of the book that functions are continuous. We'll just know that the component functions are elementary functions and therefore continuous. Okay.
why will we care about continuity so much? Well, I mean, there are calculus reasons, like you know, these differentiable functions will have to be continuous, first of all. But that's, that's not kind of the real reason. We need, well, it's not the reason we care right now. The reason we care right now is for some properties that are true for functions of a single variable that you almost take for granted, or you should take for granted. And now I need to state the corresponding results for, function, for multivariable functions. Um, so, what we'd like to do What we'd like to do is take a function like x times e to the y plus z squared and look at the set of points where inequalities are satisfied. So consider the set of all x, y, z such that in, in R3 such that x times e to the y plus z squared is greater than 2 and less than 5. Can we say anything nice about this set? Or what about if I put in less than or equal to? <clears throat> or what if I put equals, just flat out equals 7? So I look at a level set of this function. So what if I said e to the x, uh, x times e to the y plus z squared equals 7? This is a... Con this is a continuous function. It's an elementary function in terms of x, y, and z. And we're saying this continuous function is between 2 and 5, but not including 2 and 5. And here we've included 2 and 5, and here we've looked at the level set of the function where it equals 7. So where x e to the y plus z squared equals 7. Here's the good news. You can instantly say that because this is continuous, the set of, and these are strict inequalities, that this set that's described by this inequality, the described set is open. Remember, open from, from the first section. Or, yeah, it's our analog of kind of like an open interval or a union of open intervals. It's for every point in the set, any point sufficiently close to it is also in the set. At the same time, we can also say that the set that this describes, the described set, is closed. Because there is less or equal to and less than or equal to. It shouldn't be clear to you why this is true, but I am going to, I mean, this is where we're headed. This is actually a special case of this because you can write that this is that level set is where this is strictly greater than, or it's not strictly, where this is greater than or equal to 7 and less than or equal to 7, which means it equals 7. I'm just saying it's a special case of that where the two endpoints are the same. So this one is also closed, this level set. This is going to be important to us down, down the road. The level set of a continuous function is closed if it's defined, if the function is defined everywhere. So, all right. To state these things nicely, I need... I need to define a new piece of notation. So suppose I've got f, and it goes from some subset of Rn into Rp. But now I take, and suppose b is a subset of Rp. So and I've got a function, you give it n real numbers, it gives you back p real numbers in order, and I take a subset of Rp, then I want to define, we write f inverse of b. All right, now I have to say something. In the past, when we've written this inverse symbol on a function, we have meant that the function was one-to-one, -one and you think of it as restricted, its codomain is restricted to its range, and you can invert it, and you get a function back. We are not doing that. 
we are not assuming that F underline is one to one. This is going to be a set. You give it a set, it gives you back a set. Um, it is something special would happen if in fact F were invertible and so had an inverse function, but I am not writing this to mean the inverse function. Yes, it's a slight um, it's a slight problem with conflicting notations, but in context, when you put a set in there, it's never an issue. Um, you know when you put a set in there, you mean what I'm about to write, not the, the value of an inverse function at a point. F inverse of B, this means the set of all X and E, so of all X in, the, in E, such that f of x is in b. So the inverse image of a set here, so that's oh, how you read this, the inverse image of b or f inverse of b, it means all the things in here that end up in b. Right? It's a set of all x back here such that when you do f to it, you end up in b. Um, Okay, that's F inverse. The nice thing is, the reason I needed to introduce that is because this can now be easily written in terms of F inverse. If you let, I'm going to let F be the function from R3 to R given by F of X, Y, Z equals X e to the y plus z squared. All right. So I define f to be this. Then what is this set? It's exactly the set that's described here. This describes the set. F inverse of the open interval from 2 to 5. All right, understand why? Because F inverse of that means all the, all the triples x, y, z, such that if you do F to them, which means you do this, you end up in the open interval from 2 to 5. But that's just a very technical way of saying, oh, I'm looking at the set of x, y, z, such that x e to the y plus z squared is greater than 2 and less than 5, right? That's what it means to be in the open interval between 2 and 5. You're greater than 2 and less than 5. So it describes this set. The 2 less than or equal to x e to the y plus z squared. Oh, less than or equal to 5. Oh, well that describes the set f inverse of the closed interval from 2 to 5. And the level set, x e to the y plus z squared equals 7, is where it's the same as f inverse, well, of the closed interval from 7 to 7. That technically is the set containing 7, but we frequently just write it slightly sloppy, but we frequently just write f inverse of 7. You know, all those things such that f equals 7. Um, all right, so now we can look at all those sets in terms of f inverse. It's the inverse. This one's the inverse image of an open interval. This one's the inverse image of a closed interval. This one's the inverse image of a closed interval. If you remember, I said that this set was open and this set was closed. And is it a coincidence that that course, you know, that, oh, this interval is open and this interval is closed? No, that's the theorem. So, here's one of the big reasons we care about continuity right now, because it quickly tells us times when we have open and closed sets in terms of a single function. So, um, 
suppose I have a function, f from e to rp, and again, I'm thinking this as being a subset of rn, so um, a multi-component function of n variables, then the theorem is that the following are equivalent So all of them imply the others. The following are equivalent. F is continuous. Two, for all open sets, open subsets, U in RP, F inverse of U is the intersection of the domain, so of E with an open subset. of Rn. So, yeah, if you know a function's continuous, and we'll usually know that by appealing to, oh, the component functions, it's continuous if and only if all the component functions are continuous, and our component functions will be um, elementary functions. So that's how we'll normally conclude f is continuous. Then the inverse image of an open set is the intersection of E with an open subset of Rn. If E is in fact all of Rn, so that the domain is all of Rn, then the intersection of Rn with an open subset of Rn is just the open subset. And so what this says is if you have a continuous function that's defined on a real value, uh, it doesn't have to be real value, if you have a continuous function defined on all of Rn, then the inverse image of an open set under that, by that function, so F inverse of an open set, is an open set in the domain, an open subset of the domain. And the same thing is true for closed, so now I'm just going to erase two and write three. For all closed, oh, that should have been subsets. For all closed subsets, U in RP, F inverse of U is the intersection of E with the closed subset of Rn. So yes, for a continuous function, the inverse image of an open set is an open set intersected with the domain, an open subset of Rn intersected with the domain, and the inverse image of a closed set is a closed subset in Rn intersected with the domain. And if the domain is everything, that means the inverse image of open sets are open and the inverse image of closed sets are closed. And that's what we were appealing to over here. This function is continuous because it's elementary. It is defined everywhere. And so that theorem says the inverse image of an open set is open. But the open, this is the open interval from 2 to 5, so its inverse image was open. This was a closed interval from 2 to 5. It's closed. Its inverse image is closed. And so this is why if you take a continuous function of any number of variables, a real valued continuous function that's defined everywhere, and you look at the set where some strict inequalities are satisfied, that always defines an open set. And if you look at a set where um, non-strict inequalities are satisfied, so where you allow equals on each end, you always get a closed set. And one of the most important cases for us is that the level, level set of a function of a single variable, right? This is, this is a closed set, a single point, a set containing a single point is closed. Level set of a function, of a continuous function that's defined everywhere, will be a closed set. So that's how we'll use kind of continuity from time to time. There's another big reason we care about continuity that I'll go ahead and tell you, and it'll be the last thing we do in this lecture. The, hopefully you remember the extreme value theorem from single variable calculus. It says that a continuous function on a, it's usually phrased like this, that a continuous function on a closed bounded interval attains a global maximum value and a global minimum value. There's an extreme generalization of that um, to multivariable functions, an extreme generalization of the extreme value theorem. So 
Here's the extreme value theorem. The multivariable version theorem. Still, I've got f. It's a function from E, some subset of Rn, into Rp. So if you get it in real numbers, it gives you back P. Um, suppose that f is continuous and E is compact. Remember what compact means in Rn. In Rn, that's the same as being closed and bounded. So you take a closed and bounded, so you're assuming your domain is closed and bounded, or maybe you've started with a continuous function and you restrict its domain and look at some closed and bounded subset of the domain. So suppose that f is continuous and e is compact, then the image of f, then the image of f. So that's the same, it's the range. The range, image mean the same thing. The range of f. So all the things you get from doing f to values in E, the image of f is compact. We say, to say the one phrase that sounds like some kind of magical incantation, we say the continuous image of compact sets are compact. This is extremely important. I, um, I, can't, I, it's, uh, I can't prove it for you. It goes, it takes us too far out to do that. But it's important. Uh, you might say, well, how is this the normal extreme value theorem? Okay. So in particular, you could take P to be 1. So suppose you had a real value function. So in particular, oh, you can consider this part of the theorem. In particular, when P is 1, all right, so F gives you back real numbers. Well, which means the image is a compact subset of the real line. Compact subsets of the real line have maximum values and minimum values. It's uh, essentially um, part of the definition or part of the characterization of the reals. Um, in particular, when P is 1, F, so you've got F from E to R, so it's real valued. F attains, because the image, the things you get out, is compact, compact subsets have maximum values and minimum values, but that means F attains a maximum and minimum value. F attains a maximum and minimum value. You may recall we use this extensively when looking at optimization problems, max-min problems for functions of a single variable. Well, now I'm telling you it's true for multivariable functions. If you've got a continuous function um, and, you, and the domain is compact, so closed and bounded, then the function attains, there's some point, at least one, there might be more than one, some point where it actually attains its biggest value. And there's some point in the domain where it attains its minimum value. It doesn't matter how weird the function is, as long as it's continuous, which we would always conclude from being an elementary function. All right, that's your introduction, kind of fundamental basic properties of multivariable functions. Uh, in the next section, we're going to look at graphing. As I said, we'll look at graphing some real valued functions of two variables so that we can see the graphs in R3. And after that, we're going to start talking about the calculus of multivariable functions, where we start taking derivatives.